Okay, welcome to this week's CMC Markets weekly charting analysis video. My name is Jasper Lawlett, market analyst here at CMC. I've got the risk warning on the page. We're going to get through that and then um, get into what could be driving markets this week. We'll be looking at uh, the charts of some major indices, FX and commodities, and also talking about some of the major fundamental drivers. So as you can see, a little bit of a, a sketchy start to the week. We had a massive run higher on Friday in, in stock markets. Uh, so to be expected to some extent to see a little bit of a pullback. If we pull up UK markets, pull up the FTSE 100, you can see where we are. We saw that, uh, that big jump higher above the, uh, the recent uh, ceiling, which has been around the 6,000 mark. A big push up right beyond 6100 and just getting a pull back to that once resistance, now potential support. So for this breakout to really see any you know, sustained move higher, we, we ideally want to see this kind of 6000 mark. You know, I'd, I'd put the real line in the sand here at about 6010. You know, but 6,000 is the round number. We need to hold above there, really. We need to close uh, the day above there, I think, to, um, to for this for this upside breakout to sustain itself. Otherwise, you know, we may have seen the uh, the top of the retracement and could be in for a down move back, maybe sub 5,800. Now the uh, the driver you probably know of the big move higher on Friday was the uh, the policy move from the Bank of Japan. They chose to cut interest rates into the negative. You can see the uh, result in the Japanese yen if we switch across to that. Quite a strong correlation between the yen and uh, U.S. government yield, sort of the general desire for risk. And you can see there's that um, you know we're hovering sub 119, struggling to get through it, and suddenly we flew 200 pips higher to above 121, and we're sort of sustaining those gains in dollar yen at the moment. Something to look out for will be, we had sort of a one, two, three trend line break, now we're back to it, and we're right at this 200 day SMA. So a little confluence of resistance potentially below this 122 that could actually cap uh, the gains in, in dollar yen. The yen is sort of generally viewed as a, as, a, as a haven when there's some turmoil out there. So you can see dollar yen kind of moves in sync with stock markets. So if stocks can keep pushing higher, dollar yen probably can too. However, if, um, you know, as maybe today is a sign of, if stock markets start to roll over, then um, you know, dollar yen could too. It is worth noting um, just on the Japan front that uh, Kuroda, the uh, governor of the Bank of Japan, is speaking on Wednesday. So that will be, that will be an important one for both yen and, and stock markets to get us, uh, give us a little clue as to what, you know, maybe give a little bit of insight into what the thinking was and the negative rates, what he hopes to achieve from it. And uh, the market can obviously form their own opinion off that. My take is that potentially this, uh, just the cutting into negative interest rates, it's just a sign as to how little more the Bank of Japan can do on the quantitative easing front. And it was the QE that really um, boosted the, the Nikkei, boosted, uh, you know, devalued the yen. And, uh, you know, if this is a sign that there's no more QE to come, then that, that's probably actually a negative for the dollar yen, probably a positive for the, for the yen. So we'll have to see how you know how he characterizes this, and you know whether it's the sign of more things to come. Uh, Japanese inflation is still pretty weak, uh, despite all the efforts that have been made to date. Um, you know that doesn't mean that they're just going to give up on the current efforts. That probably just means they're going to ramp it up even more. But there's a question mark how much more they can actually do. The uh, Bank of Japan currently own. I believe it's about 40% of the total issuance of Japanese debt. So 60% to go, but still a um, bit of an unsustainable path, you probably agree. 
So if we work our way down the, the sort of general equity markets here, we've had a touch on the, the UK 100. Similar story in US markets. Where we had basically on, on the on the US 30, I had it down to the sort of 16180 area. You could drop that even down to sort of 16100 was the kind of ceiling to the price action since that massive drop in from January, and then we got to break through that. We're still sub the 50% retracement, and there is a little confluence of potential resistance there around that sort of 1600 to 630 mark from that that peak on January 13th and the 50 cent. Uh, Fibonacci retracement of this downdraft that um, began on uh, the day before New Year's Eve. So I, I, you know, I think this is, I think this is a breakout. You know, it's it's a fairly obvious breakout. You know, similar could be said for the FTSE 100. So we'll have to see how the the markets close in relation to, in this case, the 16180, and in the case of the FTSE 100, um, you can see on the chart there. That it's more like, as we mentioned, the sort of 6,000 to 6,010 mark, similar sort of equivalent levels. Obviously, UK markets are open now. Uh, they're down a bit. We're still basing this on US futures markets and not the actual cash markets, obviously, not open for um, another hour. Mm. No, a couple of hours, excuse me. But you can see that kind of what we're doing is we're pulling back. We just want to see how far that, that retracement goes to judge whether this break higher is sustainable. I suspect it probably will be, but I would be looking um, at possible weakness at that 1600 level in the, um, the US 30. And again, you know, the, the, always the corollary. If you find what you believe to be an important level, you know, look for a possible move from there. If there isn't one, then it can tell you that there's probably some strength in the market and you should change your bias to the other direction. As far as sort of catalysts for moves this week, um, of course, we'll talk about it in terms of the dollar as well, but we've got non-farm payrolls on Friday, so we'll probably spend a lot of the week looking towards that. We've also got some major technology company earnings, and we've actually issued a, um, a special report on some of the big ones that um, happened last week, a little summary of those, um, Amazon and Apple, most importantly, I would say, and then also the upcoming earnings this week, including Google and Yahoo. So that would be some drivers of U.S. of stocks on the earnings front, um, some of them all sort of widely watched growth companies and how well they perform, uh, but also just what's happening in China. And so today, the reason, part of the reason for we're getting a bit of a drop off here is the uh, generally weak um, manufacturing data from China. We've got services data coming out on Wednesday, so that will be another one to look out for. Later today, we have uh, ISM manufacturing from uh, the U.S., and on Wednesday, uh, you see that you know, Monday and Wednesday tend to be the days of the, um, the ISM, uh, the PMI data. You know, we'll have the services PMI data from the U.S., the ISM non-manufacturing on, on Wednesday. So I'm going to move swiftly over to the uh, the FX front here, but um, any questions at all, um, please free, feel free uh, to um, shoot it over to me, and I'm, I'm happy to happy to answer any question you might have had of what I'm talking about here, or just some uh, some other topic. Now looking at the pound. Um, you, this is the daily chart in the pound. You can see that the closing level, it's been quite a sort of volatile range in which the opening and closing levels have been fairly consistent over the past four days. And so we're just trying to decide here in, the, in, in Sterling whether we're at a base at this 140 mark, uh, 141 really. Give you some context on that 141. Here's a monthly chart. And you can see that this, this support we're looking at is multi-year support from back in 2010. We managed to just about sort of close the week, uh, close the month even, in that sort of vicinity, um, which suggests, you know, that we didn't see a substantial close below it, so uh, suggests that there's some chance of a, of a bounce back here. And then if we go to the weekly chart, you can see the kind of indecision that we're um, experiencing at the moment, where there is that 
long bottom-tailed uh, sort of doji on the uh, the previous week, and then we saw more of a kind of higher tail, top tail doji the um, you know last week. So definite indecision. We didn't quite know which way we're going. I would suggest maybe in the short term the fact that we didn't really see such a strong follow through on the original reversal would suggest that maybe we've got a little bit of a short term downside before we can probe higher again. But the best judge of that will be whether we can push and close one side of this range or the other. So 142.30, uh, I would say, on the downside, and then sort of 143.50 on the top side are kind of the kind of closing levels that we want to be eyeing up to determine which way this breakout could go. Obviously, the trend very much to the downside. So if you are taking any topside breakout, be aware that you're against the general flow of things. We're well below the 200-day moving average, which should, could suggest that we're you know, in for a bit of a move back towards it. Um, but nonetheless, that sort of denotes a downtrend, as do the, um, you know, the, lower low, the lower low and the lower high on the weekly chart. Uh, the other big event this week is the Bank of England, uh, and that includes the inflation report on Thursday. You know, the, um, you know there's been a sort of um, article doing the rounds today. Uh, it's quite worth reading. Is that um, you know Mark Carney could be one of, could be the first Bank of England governor since I think 1932 that just doesn't uh, change interest rates for his whole term. Um, he's he's supposed to be here for five years. Um, that could get extended to the normal eight, um, but you know maybe even eight years he'll fulfill the same. Um, so the, the point being that it doesn't look like UK interest rates are going up anytime soon. Um, and that's being priced into the pound, um, particularly, particularly with the likes of a you know, it looks like Cameron is making some progress supposedly in, in Europe over negotiating a a deal for the UK and Europe, so that would bring a Brexit vote closer possibly uh, this year, June or September, I think, are the two periods being talked about. So there's going to be some uncertainty about how much the Bank of England can do before that kind of vote. Um, so they're thinking that maybe that Brexit in itself is not a cause for weakness in the pound, but it can, you know, it can be a reason that the Bank of England would hold off. And so that, um, you know, that's, I think, part of the reason why we see, we've seen such a sharp sell-off. But, you know, given that we've hit these multi-year lows, you know, has it all been priced in? Can we really take the currency lower before that, before that vote's even been made? Possibly not. Now, very, uh, very interesting chart setting up in the euro at the moment. This is a daily chart. You can see these, um, these, these fairly consistent reversals of this downsloping trend line here. This is also um, a weekly high and a lower weekly high here. But more interestingly, I would say, is that we've got uh, a weekly low here and then a higher weekly low. Um, so signs that the, uh, the downtrend um, that really kicked off to, uh, in, back in um, October over speculation of a um, you know further easing, which was then disappointed in December. You know signs that maybe that um, you know, we're actually going to find these maybe see some follow through on that initial reaction in December, and maybe a topside breakout of this declining trend line. We do have the 200-day moving average um, above us, so while below that 200-day moving average, you know, uh, upside may be limited. But what I think could be interesting here is the fact that the 200-day is starting to slope higher. So obviously the market's been very flat, but the 200-day, the average over the last 200 days, is starting to slope up again. That's that's not characteristic of a downtrend. That, you know, that's more characteristic of an uptrend, as is this higher weekly low. So a couple of reasons to think that maybe we could eventually get a push through what the important one is, that is just a 110 here. I've drawn this declining trend line. I think that could give us an early warning signal, but we probably want a weekly close above 110 to really tell us that we're in business. <laughs> Um, Draghi is speaking at 4 p.m. today, so you know if he says anything particularly disappointing, we could get a pretty quick move to the top side here. 
But chances are he's probably going to really try and talk down the currency again. <clears throat> Arguably even more so in response to the Bank of Japan, given that they've just made efforts to weaken their currency, essentially, with the negative interest rates. So Draghi may feel it's necessary to step up the rhetoric to push down the euro, in which case that would kind of set up an interesting you know, scenario where maybe you get a push down through uh, this low from the 21st of January, maybe even this low from the 5th of January. And, you, you know... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the nature of the beast is, you know, obviously with trading, the stop losses are often placed beneath lows. You know, that's generally how we define the trend, isn't it? So what you can sometimes see is that the price will push lower into the kind of area where you see people selling, selling on a breakdown and uh, cutting their losses with a stop loss. So you see both stop losses and entry orders on a, on a break lower. So what you can see is sometimes is that, uh, you know, big savvier players in the market aware of the kind of general dynamic will wait for these opportunities, you know, will push prices lower on a news event like Draghi speaking into an area of lots of liquidity where there's lots of selling going on on a breakdown and stop losses and take that and, you know, and buy, <clears throat> and buy all those sell orders up and more and push the market higher. So that could be something to look out for. Moving over to commodities. Obviously, another reason why we're down in equities today is that we're um, pushing a bit lower in crude oil. So I mentioned my previous chart post was on this pretty well-defined declining trend line. I think best seen on the, on the four-hour chart, but you can on the daily too. We pushed straight through it. wasn't even, well, you know, there was. There, I think there was maybe one slight hesitation or candlestick there. We ran straight through it, but we saw a sharp reversal on the same day that we did break through it from this previous support area, which I had on my chart on this one here. So we pulled back from that. We've we pushed higher again. So we're kind of in the short term. We're a bit sideways in oil. Quite possibly, we need another little push lower towards support at 33.50 or maybe even 32.75, these, these peaks here or this peak here, um, to have a real chance to get through uh, 35.75. But I think probably despite this sharp reversal here, um, there, there's a good chance we can. The, you know, the market was overly short, and I don't think that, um, you know, there's too much interest in uh, heavily shorting after this big squeeze. And even though um, it looks like probably there isn't going to be a joint output cut from both Russia and OPEC, which is part of what fueled this uh, big spike in the prices, you know, there's still a possibility of it. And I think maybe that could dissuade a few people going short at such low levels. And then the other big one to note is, uh, you know, if you hopefully some of you watch my um, – my short snapshot video on gold from Thursday. Talked, to, you know, back when we were up at this trend line here. I talked about a possible retracement from this. At what at that point was a, a, was a possible trend line because we had we'd closed below it there, shown some evidence of resistance. I said there could be a pullback to the sort of 110 area, which was these two previous peaks. That's pretty much what we've got. We're, we're pushing back higher towards the peak again now. So a little retracement and bounce off previous resistance turn support. And characteristic of a, of a strong trend in gold with this pullback here, you know, if, you, if we'd come all the way back to the lows, you know, maybe this low from the 22nd of January or particularly even back to beneath 1080, still characteristic of an uptrend, still holding above this significant low here about 1072, but, um, you know, a much weaker uptrend. The fact that we managed to bounce straight off that 110 um, is a bit more characteristic of a, of a stronger trend where we're finding support at old highs rather than old lows. And so indicating that we could get a push through the old high, but we do have a confluence of resistance at around 1130 from the 200-day moving average and the 61.8% FIBO. Where the Fibonacci's have not been working particularly perfectly on this um, on this push higher, but still, when combined with the 200-day, could and you know, and that um, uh, and the round number of the sort of one uh, one one thirty, you know, could together cause a bit of a 
bit of a sell-off there, which is only just just above the previous peak. So we have to watch for that. But if we can close above those levels, um, not much in the way of resistance, really, all the way back up to 1180. So I think that's about it. I've said most of what I need to say. Um, not seen any questions here, so thank you all for attending. Good luck with trading this week. Jasper Lawler signing out.